When I was a young kid, I wanted to play games because they were fun. I wanted to collect all the stars, win the race, beat my friends up and not have to think about anything else. It wasn't until I was older that I began to enjoy games where sometimes the gameplay would take a step back compared to the story. Instead of mindlessly playing a game, I was invested in what would happen next. I would play a game like Dragon Age Origins and find myself not necessarily having fun at certain moments but rather stressed out and even a little bit sad at some of the choices that I had to make. I found myself drawn to these games. It felt like I was getting more of a complete experience, a roller coaster of emotions that lets you be a part of the ride. Life is Strange was really the first game I played where it was pretty apparent that you weren't really meant to have fun. Sure, there were fun moments within the game, but the tone was very dark and I often found myself having trouble sleeping right after playing the game late at night. In the past 10 years, there have been more and more of these games released. Rather than be marketed as a fun experience, these games were meant to tell a story. Much how like every TV show you watch isn't necessarily fun, these games began to touch on very real issues. And because you were now a part of the story, you had to find a way to deal with those issues. And it ended up being a very cathartic experience for many. Games began to mirror real life, and people who could relate to these characters found answers to their own questions within them. From the moment I saw the E3 trailer for Sea of Solitude, I knew this was a game I wanted to play. The art style, the look of the flooded city, the design of the protagonist, the dark tone of the game was just something that immediately attracted me to it. It was like Kingdom Hearts meets Bioshock Infinite meets Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice meets Legend of Zelda. I, like most people, hadn't heard of Jomai games before, and generally these smaller unheard of studios can offer the most unique and artistic experiences. The game was even mentioned in a New York Times article talking about how more and more games are starting to focus their stories on mental health issues, issues that plague many of those who play games to escape the world. Rather than just escape from the individual's problems, these games attempt to give a different perspective on matters and perhaps help you discover your own solutions. The writer and creative director of the game, Cornelia Geppert, specifically created Sea of Solitude about when she felt like she was at an extremely lonely time of her life. It was a deeply personal story but she created it in hopes to help others, and that's what I'd like to take up some of your time today to really put a spotlight on the Sea of Solitude. Now this video will contain spoilers as well as an analysis of this game. I would definitely recommend playing the game, but if for some reason that's not possible for you, on my Let's Play channel Jafferdub there is a full Let's Play of me playing through it. It's roughly three and a half hours and you can see my first reactions to the game. But for the sake of being on the same page, let's summarize what happens. I'm so tired of it. So damn tired. There must be a way out of here. I want to change it. Change me! Sea of Solitude starts off with the introduction of Kay. Kay takes the form of a black monster with glowing eyes and a bright colored backpack. She says that despite the fact that she has family and friends, she feels lonely and is surrounded by darkness. We see her in a boat floating atop a completely submerged city when she spots a light far off in the distance. Here she meets a young girl in a yellow rain jacket, simply known as Girl, who claims to know her and she lights up the entire world. I have a present for you. Be safe.
she gives Kay the power to use a flare, which is your main mechanic throughout the game, and she will also help guide you in the right direction if you are lost. The girl tells you that he is waiting for us, although Kay doesn't seem to know who she's referring to. After traveling and exploring for a bit, a large dark monster in the form of a girl wearing a shell blocks your path, calling Kay fake and worthless. Kay, you worthless piece of shit. You have no idea what you're doing, do you? As usual. I'm trying! She knows my name. In order to get past her, Kay has to control these floating silhouettes made of light that shoot a beam at the monster. As she walks around, however, there is another monster swimming through the flooded streets, and if you spend too much time in the water, you will be eaten. Throughout the level, there are bottles to collect, which appear to be a journal, but we're not sure who it's written by, and birds to shoo away. Kay also gains the ability to clear corruption, which takes the dark energy surrounding something and puts it in her bag. After getting past the monster, Kay meets a ball of light, whom she affectionately calls Glowy, who guides her in certain directions by splitting the water and creating a path for her. As Kay walks down, she begins to hear conversations from her past, the first being with her mother, shortly before her brother is born. Do you remember this place? It was our favorite cafe. It's been years. Do you think they'll give me free cake like the first time you came here? Well, technically the first time you were here was nine months before you were born. Well, yeah. Glowy eventually leads her to a large bird-type monster which Kay identifies as looking quite somber, and so she begins to work her way towards it. As she gets closer, she hears conversations between her and her brother, Sunny, where her brother begins to talk about being severely bullied, but Kay is too wrapped up in her relationship to pay attention to him. Sunny believes these bullies are actually his friends and asks Kay for advice, only to be met with nothing as Kay continues to be too distracted. I'm so happy you're walking into school, Kay. I've been feeling a bit, I don't know, fed lately. Hmm? That's great, Sunny. Hey, are you even listening to me? Huh? Sorry, I was texting my boyfriend. <laughs> oh, he's calling me. I've gotta go. Have fun with your friends, yeah? <laughs> no, wait. Okay, bye. Here we gain a new mechanic of luring shadow creatures into light sources to make them disappear, the creatures seemingly being representations of Sunny's bullies. It doesn't take long for Kay to realize that Sunny has also taken on the form of a monster, that being the gigantic bird we saw from earlier. Kay apologizes for not realizing the bullying was so bad and vows to help him, but he takes off, leaving her to follow. We hear more and more of Sunny getting bullied and having self-doubts, taking sports classes just to fit in, and ultimately wondering if he should stop living. This ends in a final scene where Kay must help Sunny overcome the shadows and stand up to the bullies. Sunny, I'm so sorry I didn't see any of this before. I'm so sorry I didn't listen to you. I'll never ban you again. I promise. Okay? <laughs> Kay promises never to abandon Sunny again, and Sunny is transformed into his human form. However, as Kay is still a monster, she and Sunny can no longer communicate with each other. It's during this time as well that Kay begins to doubt herself. Wondering if perhaps what the monsters had previously said were right, and that maybe she was just selfish and only thought of herself. Strange. The first monster, she said such terrible things about me. But they were true. She told me I only cared about myself. I didn't see it before now, I swear. At least I finally really listened to Sunny. That's all that matters now. The boat that Sunny is on crashes and Kay leaves to find help, but instead finds Girl, 
hanging out with a multi-legged sea monster in the water. Oh hi! I've been searching everywhere for you, but instead I found her. Uh, hi? I'm Kay. Leave me alone. The monster screams that she's trying to focus and that everyone always wants something from her when a chameleon-like creature interrupts. The monster hurls Girl towards the tower that the chameleon is in, and so Kay follows in that direction. Ugh! Now she is your problem! Ah, good. Now, where was I? Kay makes her way to the tower and begins hearing conversations of her and her family. Their father had made trip plans for the family, but dropped out at the last moment. Kay begins to have relationship problems with her boyfriend, Jack, feeling he's gone distant, while her mother is beginning to go through a similar thing with Kay's father. However, Kay is too involved in her own relationship to realize her mom is having issues. Mama, I don't get it. Jack is so distant lately. Kay, I have my own things to deal with right now, okay? Your father- But I'm just confused. Jack used to be the most loving man on the planet, but now he is never really there anymore. Kay deducts that the chameleon is her father, while the creature in the water is her mother. After scaling to the top of the tower, Kay confronts her father. He talks about not belonging with the family, and that he doesn't know how to handle the situation anymore. The tower collapses, and although she's tired and fatigued, Kay desires to help him. Kay's parents begin arguing, with her father saying her mother destroyed everything and doesn't care about what he wants, considering how much he sacrificed for the family. Kay's mother believes that perhaps just giving him some space is the solution. I just need to be more patient and understanding. If I give him space, then everything will be fine. The two continue, seemingly completely forgetting that Kay is even among them. Kay's father feels he can't be happy with her anymore, and while she feels like she has to keep trying to encourage him, she also is trying to give him space. I can look after Sunny. I wanted to help him. I needed to help him. But this? What can I even do here? It's too painful. Is there even something for me to learn? Kay is led to the summer market where she begins collecting memories and hearing her parents' first date. Kay's dad, Adam, keeps making references to having children while Kay's mother, Vivienne, finds it awkward but also slightly endearing. Look at those tiny baby socks! Are they hand? Maybe we should buy them! Oh, really? We should buy the baby socks. What, what's that supposed to mean? Well, if you like their socks, then they might fit some potential babies. I was just joking. <laughs> Come on, Adam. Isn't it too early to be talking about babies? All I'm saying is, you're the kind of person I could imagine having kids with. <laughs> It's too much for a first date, isn't it? Well... It's okay, it's kind of... cute that you're thinking about it. Let's take it a bit slow, okay? But as we get further into their early years, we start to see some problems arise in their relationship, such as Adam arriving home late for Kay's birthday, thinking she's three years old when she's actually four, and having previously gone on a work trip for two days, not communicating with Vivian at all during this time. <laughs> there she is! I can't believe you're already three! You are so tall! She's four, Adam. Four? Of course. So grown up. <laughs> Honey, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm late. Late? I haven't heard from you in two days. Two days you've been gone! I thought you were dead! As Kay tries to approach her parents, she once again confronts the monster in the shell. 
The monster tells her that she's the reason her parents are unhappy, and that by trying to help, she's only making things worse, saying that she's already let her brother down and will let her parents down too. If I stop now, nothing will ever get better. But it might get worse. <laughs> I have to try. We discover one of the last breaking points for Kay's family, that Adam is so busy at work and doesn't spend much time at home with the family. Vivienne buys a house, hoping it would encourage more time together, but it seems to set him off. You see that house over there? Yes. Do you like it? It's a nice house. Oh, well, it's ours now. Wait, what? Are you serious? Yes! While Vivienne wants to work things out, Adam wants to be left alone, saying they've tried to talk it out and it hasn't worked. Adam claims that he never wanted kids, despite talking about it all the time, and he believes they were happier before Kay and Sunny arrived. Vivienne admits that she believed having kids would be a way to make Adam stay and keep the love alive, but Adam accuses her of having selfish intentions. We were happy at first! But that wasn't enough for you, was it? What? No. You had to have a family. You had to have kids. You were talking about kids all the time. You people say a lot of things when they're falling in love. I can't believe you. you. Please, stop. Adam says he still loves the family, but believes the kids would be in a better environment if they were to separate, so that they both can move forward and pass this chapter in their lives. As this discussion is going on, Kay collapses from fatigue, and both stop what they're arguing to make sure that she's okay, turning them both back into humans. Oh no. Kay! Oh no! Kay! 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 Princess! Princess. They appear on the boat with Sunny, but Kay remains a monster, still separated from her family. The world begins to freeze, and Kay walks through the frozen tundra only to find her boyfriend, Jack, taken on the form of a large white wolf. I'm so happy to see you. I missed you so much. Jack, it's you, of course. Oh god, I miss you so much too. So much. I have so many things to tell you. I've learned all about listening and how to help and even let me- oh! What? What's wrong? Why would you hurt me like that? When she approaches him and makes contact with him, a part of his face breaks off, revealing a partial black wolf. He runs away while the girl in the yellow jacket right behind him. Kay picks up the broken part of his face and decides she's going to try and heal him. We see glimpses of the start of their relationship when Kay runs into the shell monster. The monster, clearly weak and docile now, begins begging and pleading with Kay not to proceed, that she'll destroy herself if she continues. The monster claims she was only trying to stop Kay from being hurt, which is why she had previously blocked her path before. Please, if you go on like this, you will destroy yourself. If you keep getting in my way, I will destroy you. Kay, why won't you listen? After destroying the shell, we see the monster, shaking scared for what she believes will happen if Kay proceeds to try to help Jack. Kay assures her that she'll be fine, that she'll heal Jack, and that Jack will in turn heal her. Kay catches up with Jack, and Jack forgives her for hurting him earlier, and compliments her on her backpack, which Kay hasn't even realized that she's been carrying. After another physical touch, it breaks off more of the white exterior, causing him to retreat once again. <laughs> I'm here. I'll listen. I'll help you. Don't talk to me like I'm sick! I'm fine! Leave me alone! No, please! I just wanted to help. We find Girl, who now is very upset and takes on the form of a screaming demon, blaming Kay for Jack's sadness. 
We then go through a mini game where we take Jack's face piece and outrun demons in order to melt the ice to continue forward. We hear more prior conversations of Kay and Jack's relationship. He had left the party early without saying anything, and said that he'd rather not be around people as often as he had been. Later, we hear Kay and Jack echo a similar conversation that Kay's parents had shared earlier. Jack apparently had not spoken to Kay in two weeks, and when she shows concern, he calls her selfish for trying to make it about her while he was going through a dark time. He begs her to leave him alone, saying that staying will only hurt her. Why have you been ignoring me? Relax, you're stressing me out. Fourteen days! Fourteen days since I heard from you! I didn't know if you were hurt or... or dead? Did you not think about how I would feel, even for a second? Honey, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm late. Late? I haven't heard from you in two days. Two days you've been gone. I thought you were dead. Did you think about us, about how we would feel? Kay finds Jack being attacked by the demon girls and rescues him. He's being attacked by those things. Leave him alone! Jack believes that staying with Kay will only hurt her, and that he needs time to figure out his own life, and believes that Kay would benefit from doing the same. No. No. I can figure this out. Don't leave me alone! Face it! Let go of me. Let go of us. Okay? Take care of yourself. Kay is left alone when her bag explodes and lets out all the corruption and darkness it once contained. As she walks alone in the dark, the monster in the water reminds her that it's still there and that it will always be with her. She's very tired and sluggish and now can hardly walk. Kay reunites with Girl, back to her yellow jacket form, who apologizes for before, and Kay forgives her. Girl says that she can help Kay by sharing the burden with her, and allowing Kay to move more freely. It's okay. We're together again. That means something, doesn't it? You're right! I was and always will be by your side, Kay. I promise. I know. From now on, we can do this together. Okay. But how? We just have to share the burden. It will make you feel lighter, I promise. By sending Girl the darkness and corruption, Kay can move faster and navigate the water more freely without the water monster going after her. They look off in the distance and see the other monster, still without her shell. Kay apologizes to the monster, but the monster says Kay did the right thing, and asks her to follow. She says the experience with Jack was painful, but important for her to learn. Kay, Girl, and the now friendly shellless monster set up a trap for the water monster to finally defeat it once and for all, which involves the shell monster sacrificing herself and being eaten. Kay initially refuses, saying she believes they are now friends and that she no longer feels alone when she's around. However, the plan still goes through, and the monster is eaten. Kay, sometimes, in order to heal, you need to let go. No! For the first time, I don't feel lonely. I can't lose you. It's not about loss. It's about change. Suddenly the world lights up and Kay can move more freely without the corruption surrounding her. She discovers a small child version of the monster who now has her shell again, and Girl reveals a small baby version of the sea monster and the four embrace. 
They are now all submerged underwater, and when Kay emerges, she is finally human again. She swims towards the island in front of her, seeing the boat her family was once on. She asks, Are you ready? And we cut to the final credits of the game, and thus ends Sea of Solitude. But it doesn't take much to figure out that what's happening literally within the game is full of symbolism and imagery that translates to a much deeper story. I'm going to go into my own interpretations, but by no means is this the official definitive, yes this is what's happening for sure. The game was made in such a way that you can take certain parts and adapt it into something you can relate to. If you feel or see something different and feel comfortable sharing, please let me know. I would love to see how other people can interpret this. One of the biggest things here are the things that Kay interacts with, mainly the water monster, the shell monster, and girl. To me, these are all full representations of herself. Girl, while seemingly a bit cheerier and in some cases acts as a guiding light to Kay, prioritizes Jack over herself. At the very beginning, she tells Kay he is waiting, probably trying to hurry Kay through her family issues so that she can go straight to him. When Kay seemingly hurts Jack, Girl lashes out and becomes a demon-like creature. This could easily be seen as Kay lashing out against herself, upset and angry because she's placed Jack's well-being over hers and she felt she didn't deserve to be happy after hurting him. You ruined it! You should have let me do the talking! The water monster is the inner, most darkest part of her mind. There's very little vocal interaction with it, but if Kay times something wrong, or isn't quite paying attention, it will literally consume her. It constantly taunts her and threatens her, and even by the end of the game, it has the smallest resolution to it. She doesn't really acknowledge it or forgive it, but she makes peace with it. As it told Kay, it will always be with her, and while it technically still is, it no longer carries the same power over her. Are you still with me, monster? I will always be by your side, Kay. Maybe we really do deserve each other. The most interesting and changing relationship that Kay has in the game is the one with the shelled monster. When we first encounter her, she taunts Kay calling her worthless and fake. The next time we see her, she insults Kay for not paying attention to Sunny earlier and for trying to get involved in her parents' marriage problems, but her attitude and demeanor changes by the time we find her next. She begs and pleads Kay not to help Jack, saying it'll destroy her if she continues. Cruel monster. Kay, this is serious. Please listen to me. I... No! Jack is here! I was just on my way to apologize. Please! If you go on like this, you will destroy yourself. If you keep getting in my way, I will destroy you. Kay! Why won't you listen? She says she tried to stop her from helping her parents to protect her. She says, that's natural. We fight. That's what we do. Kay insists that Jack will help her change, but the monster disagrees. When Kay breaks her shell, she stands cold and shivering. When Kay apologizes, she's scared, but lets Kay pass. I'm scared. You don't need to be. I know what I'm doing. Kay, don't you see what you're becoming? You really don't understand. The monster tries to protect Kay from draining herself emotionally. Ultimately, when Jack declines her offer to help, Kay is left broken and miserable. She suddenly feels not good enough and is left alone. At the end, despite all the terrible things the monster and girl had done to her, she greets them as friends. They apologize to her, and she apologizes to them. The now shellless monster says it was important for her to learn with Jack that she couldn't help everyone, and even though it would be a painful experience, she reassures Kay that she's not alone. Do you trust me now? Of course. 
The experience with Jack was painful, but it was important. You needed to learn. It almost destroyed me. I'm all alone now. Are you? Do you feel lonely? I don't know how to feel anymore. Kay, you are not alone. You will never be if. Of what? What do you mean? Kay, be patient. Please. In the end, the monster sacrifices herself to the water monster, saying it's not about loss, it's about change. The newborn monster asks, did you find out who can truly help you? Kay responds that she knows and the four embrace, completing her and turning her back into a human form. This monster more or less seems to be the inner thoughts of Kay, trying to protect her from confrontation. While the monster insulted her many times, it was almost like a protection mechanism. And when Kay started ignoring it, she became spent emotionally. She knew Kay would be hurt by realizing she wasn't there for her brother, that she indirectly is a source of her parents' problems, and that Jack wouldn't be able to help her like she hoped. The other relationships Kay has is with her family. Her brother was being severely bullied, but she was so caught up in her relationship she failed to realize just how severe it was. But in the end, she comes to his rescue and protects him and promises not to fail him again deep down knows she should have been there in the first place. You then have Kay and her parents, and very similarly, Kay is caught up in her own relationship with Jack to hear the things her mom is telling her. She discovers the truth about her parents' unhappy marriage, and hears the angry things her dad tells her mom, even going as far as saying he believes the kids were only a manipulative tool to keep the couple together. So you were lying about wanting kids? No! I might have wanted them eventually, but you wouldn't wait. I thought it would help. How? You were drifting away. I thought if we had a little one, it... It would be better for you? No. For us. I tried everything to make you happy. So, it's all my fault? In the end, it's for her own safety that Adam and Vivienne stay together realizing they need to let go of some things and work on others in order to give the children a better life at home. However, when Kay confronts Jack, he insists he wants to be left alone. This devastated her, as this is now a problem that she can't solve. If my theory is correct and Girl is just another part of Kay, then she effectively turns on herself, blaming herself for Jack's problems. She's also so invested in the relationship that she feels that she has no one once it's over, the shell monster tries to protect her from this, knowing that Kay will overspend herself trying to help someone who simply doesn't want it. He's gone. Everyone is gone. They all moved on. Except me. I'm stuck. Here in the dark. Within Kay's relationships, we see three different ways to solve problems. Sunny reached out for help when he felt he was at a breaking point, and while she wasn't there for him earlier, Kay was there when it mattered most. Adam and Vivienne, while their problems were not solved, realized there was something bigger and much more important going on than the issues they were having. For the sake of their family, they decided to stay together and continue to work on their problems. With Jack, however, he ultimately decided that what he needed was time alone. He didn't feel like Kay could be there for him, nor could he be there for Kay. He believed his problems needed to be solved by himself on his own, and that by doing so, he would be sparing Kay a lot of pain and trouble. Rather than stay and try to fix a problem that maybe couldn't be solved, he walked away entirely, hoping both would be better off for it. This particularly hurts Kay, as she just witnessed her parents staying together to solve their problems, but couldn't stay with Jack to solve theirs. Then let me help you! What if... you can't help me? Listen to me. I need to figure this out on my own. I can't do that if you're in my life. You need to let me go. Another thing I want to draw attention to is the bag. Kay carries a bag around the entire game, collecting corruption and storing it in the bag. However, it's revealed at one point that she doesn't even realize she's wearing the bag. 
You look so cute with your backpack. Have I been carrying it this whole time? When Jack leaves her, the bag explodes. She had spent so much of her energy collecting everyone else's darkness, she had failed to address her own. The more she collected, the more it weighed down on her and fatigued her. When Jack wasn't there for her, she felt lost and truly alone, and carrying everyone else's problems with her became too much. Kay had invested so much of herself into this relationship that she never considered the fact that Jack would leave her. She had ignored her family's struggles to nurture this relationship, blamed herself for her family's problems, tried to fix them, and in the end, Jack wasn't there to help fix her like she thought he would be. Sometimes coming out the other side of a long relationship can feel like becoming a new person. You rediscover who you are without them, and it really changes the relationship you have with yourself. In this case, the three representations of Kay's mindset, which had all taken a darker form, became what saved her in the end and brought her back to her human form. When I was reading people's thoughts on this game, four things were repeated quite often. Number one, the art style is absolutely fantastic, and I 100% agree. When I first saw the trailer, the art is what brought me into this world. The light, vibrant colors of the city, contrasting with the dark hallways of the school, the water, and the way the waves bounce around, it really is a fantastic looking game, and the art team deserves all the credit they received for it. Not to be overlooked either is the soundtrack, which maybe you don't notice all the time, but adds tons of atmosphere to what you're doing. Number 2. Many people found the gameplay lacking, and to that, I would have to say that maybe this isn't a game where gameplay is the main focus. Obviously, the story is the main part of the game, but I do think the added moments of gameplay give you something to do in between these story moments. There's enough there to make you feel involved, and enough to change things up as you progress that you're not just doing the same things. I wouldn't say it's one of the hardest games I've ever played, nor one of the most difficult to learn, but I really do believe that gameplay was never meant to be the main focus. As I said in the beginning, the game was never intended to be fun, but an experience. For a game of this type, that are so heavy and rich in story, there's honestly a lot more gameplay than I was expecting. Number 3. The voice acting is less than amazing. If you actually look at the actor's IMDB pages, you'll find only a few have prior acting experience. For games made by smaller studios, I've definitely heard a lot worse. Is it the greatest? Not by any means. But I really didn't feel it was that bad when I was playing it. It didn't stand out in a negative way. I actually thought it fit the tone of the game quite well, and not sure if fancier names or a bigger budget for voice acting would have really made a big difference. For what it was delivering, I thought it delivered well. And lastly, I saw some people who said that Kay was not a relatable character. Now obviously this is different for every person, and even though I don't have a story exactly like Kay's, I've gone through moments in my life where I have been extremely lonely and isolated. I can relate to Kay's struggle when she suffers from extreme fatigue trying to help everyone only to be let down when no one's there to help her. The people who couldn't identify with Kay may have never felt that sense of extreme loneliness or isolation, and I'm not faulting them for that. Kay's struggle, while a specific story, has elements that many others have gone through, and allows them to put themselves in her situation. Cornelia Geppert, who wrote Sea of Solitude, said she wrote the game based off a very lonely time in her life after the end of a relationship. For her, it was a very personal story, but as she also states in the beginning of the game, Kay's journey is about what it means to be human and to live with all of life's ups and downs. What Cornelia went through and how she dealt with it will not be the same as anyone else. She made the game not as a step-by-step -step instructions on how to heal, but rather how she healed. You could probably come to the conclusion that Cornelia had invested too much into her relationship, neglected those she cared about to nurture that relationship, and when the relationship ended, she had to find herself again. Or of course, the situation could be completely different, but this is how she chose to represent it. Either way, you can tell this was a very deep and personal experience for Cornelia to make, and I feel she did a great job at representing this through these monsters that Kay interacts with and making it a relatable experience for those who have gone through something similar. Did you find out who can truly help you? Yes. I know now.
At the end of the game, Kay realizes that only she herself can make herself better, but I feel like it's important to stress that this isn't always the case for everyone. Sometimes confronting the monsters within you and on your own can be exactly what you need to get out of a dark place, like Kay, but sometimes you need a hand, like Sunny, and that's never anything to be ashamed of. If your problem is with one singular person like Adam and Vivienne, then having an honest heart-to-heart -heart conversation with them might be what helps you realize if you continue your relationship or be like Jack and Kay and choose to walk away and heal on your own. There are many ways for someone to battle their own demons and I encourage anyone listening who may be fighting their own battle to not be afraid to reach out and ask for help when you need it. Sea of Solitude is a journey of one person's battle with their own demons. Made from a deeply personal place, you feel that while experiencing this game. Are there tons of mechanics, a leveling system, equipment, and inventory? No. But the game wasn't really meant to be fun. It was meant to be an experience of lightness and darkness and healing seen through the eyes of a young girl named Kay, made for people who wanted to interact with the experience. As games go on, people find more and more ways to use it as a storytelling medium, rather than having winners and losers, points, levels, or unlockables. Games like Telltale's The Walking Dead and Hellblade's Senua's Sacrifice and now Sea of Solitude all tell a story that you may or may not enjoy in a fun sense, but provide a worthwhile experience that teaches us about ourselves, our darkest times, and how we as humans can overcome them. Are you ready?